As we talk about long-run macroeconomic policies, an important concept will be the idea of an aggregate production function. Now, you will have seen production functions in a microeconomics uh, part of a course. And recall that a production function essentially relates the inputs to final output. So how much you put in combined with the technology uh, and how much output you get as a consequence of those, uh, of using those inputs. When we talk about an aggregate production function, it's a, it's a much more conceptual idea. I think it's easier to think about, well, how much, how many workers does a company hire and how many machines have they got and uh, what, uh, you know, what, are they using the latest technology? And you kind of think about that as is the, the uh, outcomes for a particular firm. This is for the economy as a whole. And uh, again, it's a, little bit, it's a little bit more abstract, but bear with me. And I want to give you a sense of this so that you can understand how economists think about the long run capabilities of an economy to produce goods and services, GDP. And in this process, we're going to use a number of uh, the basic concepts that we've introduced in other videos, functions of multiple variables, percentage change, production functions, marginal productivity, and constant returns to scale. <clears throat> now, the way I'm going to write this aggregate production function is the following, where y represents the total value of output in real terms. Okay, real GDP, inflation adjusted, the actual output. And that is going to depend on, equal to, a production function, F, which relates the amount of capital, so this is the total capital stock. Now you can think of that as the infrastructure, the factories, the buildings, all the different physical attributes, stuff that's that is uh, available to, to use to produce goods and services. So, and that's denoted by K. And we're not going to make a distinction here between the use of capital in one sector versus the other. It's just the total amount. And the total workforce we're going to depict as L. That's the number of, of laborers. Now, a couple of things that I'm not including in this discussion, just for simplicity, not taking into account, for example, that there could be skilled workers and unskilled workers. We're not taking into account that there is land uh, or that there are different types of capital. Again, just a notional um, uh, conceptual framework. And we're going to have this variable, we're going to call it capital A by uh, convention, which is going to depict the technological capabilities of the economy. So we should think about this for a second. Let's say that we had a level of capital, level of labor in an economy, okay, and we, get, we have output associated with that, and some constant A. Okay, don't worry about what A is for a second. And then there's some technological innovation that makes all the capital and all the labor more productive. You can model that. You can think of that as A getting bigger. You can multiply the, the output that you would get with the existing capital and labor stock and 
technological improvement would just, you, you've got the same amount of stuff, same amount of inputs, and you can get more output. Okay, so what, what this aggregate production function is telling you is the available inputs, how these get turned into output, and also some depiction of uh, technological progress. Now I could say, I would say that you could, you could also depict technological pro uh, progress through changing this production function f, but economists don't uh, traditionally do that. They have a, this, this simple form of uh, A. Okay. We've got constant returns to scale by assumption, which means that if we double the amount of capital and double the amount of labor simultaneously, we would get double the amount of output. Okay, so that there's a separate video about constant returns to scale, so kind of set that, set that aside. We're making a, a, a basic assumption about, about that. Um, we're going to have diminishing marginal productivity. If you change one of the inputs, keeping the other input constant, the extra output you get diminishes. Again, separate video about diminishing marginal productivity. Now, if we think about graphing this with um, the price level, okay, this that the price on this axis is going to be the overall price level in the economy. It's not the price of a particular good, it's the overall price level. It could be the consumer price index or the, the real GDP deflator. It's the overall price level. And then we've got a level of output. Essentially, what this means is that the long run aggregate supply is determined by the capital stock, by the labor stock, the technology, <coughs> that level of supply, the maximum, the long run, the, most, the best you can do is going to depend on these things, capital stock, the labor stock, and technology. The only way you can change the long run aggregate supply is by changing some of these underlying factors, the stock of capital, the stock of labor, the technology. This long run aggregate supply curve doesn't depend on the price level. You, know, you could double prices, it's not going to change what you can you know, what you can do if you get everybody working full time and, you know, in the most efficient way possible. Instead, it's, it's vertical.